All right, it's 10.01 and I'd like to start our wonderful webinar today. My name is Jess Keener Haas and on behalf of the AEDY team, I'd like to welcome you to the fourth training in our AEDY conference series. Um, before I introduce our presenter, I'd like to share that we are in the webinar format and you will, have the ability, you will not have the ability to unmute your microphone, but you will have the opportunity to ask questions in the chat throughout the session. Someone from our AEDY team will track them and offer them to the presenter at the end of our presentation. So we're very excited to have Dr. Kim Gorgans with us today presenting brain injury disrupting the revolving door of the juvenile justice system. Dr. Kim Gorgans is a professor of psychophysiology, clinical neuropsychology, and psychology of criminal behavior at the University of Denver. She manages a large portfolio of traumatic brain injury related research and has lectured extensively on those issues, including a 2010 TED Talk on youth sport concussions, a 2018 TED Talk on brain injuries in criminal justice, and several NPR spots, including an interview on CNN with Anderson Cooper. Her work has been featured in US News, Newsweek, Salon.com, and more. Her research studies the reported injury history, cognitive function, and brain biomarkers of youth and college athletes, probationers, and inmates. Her mission is to better understand the short and long-term impacts of injuring our most vital organ. Without further ado, I would love to turn it over to Dr. Gorgans. Jess, thank you so much. And thanks to your audience. Thanks to ADY for having me. Uh, thanks for letting me cram so much into an hour. My full disclosure is that I uh, overdo everything. And I love the chance to talk about the work that we're doing in Colorado, which benefits largely from the leadership of Pennsylvania. And I'll share some of the Pennsylvania data today, just to give you a little flavor of uh, the leadership that you guys have. Uh, I always say it's hard to be a king in your own kingdom. And uh, for me in Colorado to be able to come on here and talk about how much Pennsylvania is doing to lead the country in this space in uh, disrupting the school to prison pipeline for kids, especially kids with brain injury, uh, is a great platform to have. So I'm proud to be able to say that. So thank you guys for having me here and for being part of this like amazing solution that I get to support remotely. So here are the stated learning objectives. Like I said, I will uh, overdo all of this. So there's a ton of content. Jess has the slides. I think all of the um, attendees will have those slides too. And you've got all the hyperlinks. So there's no need to like uh, record anything that I'm saying. And I'm totally available after the fact to anybody with questions or to consult on cases. My financial disclosure is I don't have any. So I'm always on the lookout for uh, a good conflict of interest. <laughs> so, like any researcher, we're good at like putting together huge projects with like sticks and tape and chewing gum. So uh, we're really good at doing things for free. And I'm gonna share some of our like free instruments with you today that we've developed. Uh, we have had funding in the past from the federal government. We've had funding from Colorado. We're largely now in year eight, working on the uh, collaborative efforts of partners around the state and partners around the country. Okay, so now we get to talk about my favorite thing in the world. This is a review for some of your participants today, but uh, I wanna just talk about how high the stakes are for traumatic brain injury in particular. So these are some data we're gonna circle back and talk about some of the data that we've generated and published with here in Colorado. Uh, the data about the frequency or the incidence of traumatic brain injury and criminal justice is really high. So depending on the setting, we'll talk more about that, the rate of traumatic brain injury history in among folks who are in criminal justice settings, so that's in probation or problem solving courts and in jail and prison, is anywhere from 25 to 97%. And the 97% was some of our data here in Colorado. 48% of people who are homeless have a history of traumatic brain injury. We have a really cool project going here in Colorado uh, with partners along the front range looking at 
the temporal relationship between homelessness and traumatic brain injury. So there isn't a lot of research looking at chicken and egg, which came first? Was it the traumatic brain injury created a kind of cognitive, oftentimes vulnerability that predisposes someone to homelessness or does being homeless create a set of vulnerabilities, including exposure to risk for exposure to interpersonal violence? So we're doing that research now. Uh, spoiler, our research suggests that this number is closer to 70%. We've not published with those data yet, but they're in preparation now. Uh, for folks who have traumatic brain injury, 60% of them have a significant substance use problem and 60% of folks who have a traumatic brain injury have a mental illness. We'll see how those numbers are even higher when you're looking through the justice system lens, particularly adult and juvenile justice. Wearing my neuropsychologist hat for just a minute, I want to focus our attention because I think these might be some of the highest stakes on the mental health fallout after brain injury. Uh, what you see is a really direct cause and effect relationship between a traumatic brain injury and the development of a new mental illness. So almost half of folks with traumatic brain injury who have no history of mental illness will develop some clinically significant syndrome within that first year. And you can see the kinds of cases those are. So most often depression, but also new things like a bipolar mood disorder, this is the work that uh, all of the folks who are doing care coordination or working with uh, kids with traumatic brain injury or adults with traumatic brain injury, this is the work you do. So you know these data really well, is that it's like detonating a grenade in a family. So 85% of families report that the problems the survivor has create significant impact and negative impact on family function. And really importantly, suicide. So self-harm risk is extraordinarily high after traumatic brain injury. Here you can see these data suggest that ideation, suicidal ideation, so suicidal thoughts are seven times higher and the risk for suicide persists for 15 years post-injury. This uh, colleague of mine, Faisal, is doing this research and published with longitudinal data that at that time were 15 years old. So we would expect these, the significant risk of increased risk of self-harm to persist for even longer. There are really interesting sequela or consequences that are unique for pediatric brain injury. So what you see in pediatric brain injury is a chicken and egg relationship between the traumatic brain injury. So for example, uh, kids who have pre-existing psychopathology, and that includes everything from uh, ADHD, hyperactivity, mental illness. Uh, you can see here, I've got some notes about all of the kinds of psychosocial vulnerabilities that kids present with. Kids with those kinds of vulnerabilities are more likely to sustain an injury. So you can see even with parents abusing substances confers a risk for their kids to be injured. On the other side of the chicken and egg phenomena is that there's a very clear cause and effect relationship between the injury and the development of new psychopathology. In a way that is true for about half of adults, you see that for kids, the risk of developing things like ADHD after injury are very high. And likely this is because the consequences of injury look like ADHD in the classroom. So it's like uh, whatever you call this thing, which is behavioral discontrol or being really impulsive in the classroom. So that looks like ADHD. So you can see up to half of folks will be diagnosed with ADHD after a brain injury. And you see this close to 20% uh, of school age kids with traumatic brain injury have this significant pattern of disruptive behavior, which is what we're talking about today. The Pennsylvania data just shared some of these data uh, the statistically speaking, about 6,000 kids have a primary diagnosis of TBI. What we know from working in the pediatric brain injury space is that's likely a much lower uh, count than is true of the general population. So a lot of kids, as many as nine of 10 kids, won't seek emergency room care or medical attention at the time of an injury. And you can imagine that all of these kids who present in classrooms as defiant or disrespectful, they're impulsive, they have a hard time concentrating, they're inattentive, they may have traumatic brain injury, but we assign a, an LD or ADHD label to them and we treat them 
uh, accordingly. So we move them through the school system, out of the school system problematically and into the justice system, which again, we're gonna uh, spend a lot more time talking about uh, disrupting. There are really unique risks also for young women. So there is a whole separate conversation to be had about unique risks for older women, women particularly in the space of risk for developing dementia disease. What you also see though in young women is that A, there's not nearly enough research. So a lot of the research we have about pediatric brain injury is largely informed by the study of male athletes, high school and college athletes. Uh, all of the research we have on traumatic brain injury in adults is informed by returning service personnel, the majority of whom are male. So we know much less about injury in women. What we do know from special study of women is that girls are more likely to report a cluster of more significant symptoms after even a mild brain injury. The conventional wisdom, which was junk, used to hold that girls were more forthcoming with their symptom reports and nobody ever thought to wonder if perhaps women due to all kinds of physiological differences, including endocrine differences, might actually have a different set of sequelae or consequences after injury. Women are more likely, young women are more likely to report uh, suicidality. So the risk for self-harm is even higher among young women. And 50% of women, uh, females, report that they don't receive the care they need. And this is particularly true for mental health care. And I will say my personal crusade is to do better education with my uh, mental health colleagues because we're notoriously bad at recognizing TBI and accommodating cognitive deficits in psychotherapy, for example. So we're missing the boat altogether. Zooming out really quickly, let's talk about why you should screen for traumatic brain injury in justice settings. So there are some uh, obvious answers to this. One of the most obvious is that there's a federal requirement to screen for traumatic brain injury in justice settings. This was a 2006 report from the Vera Institute, which is a think tank that um, researches contemporary problems and makes a set of recommendations to the Department of Justice. So you can see that in 2006, their recommendation for policy change was that we screen routinely for traumatic brain injury. And if only that were true from 2006 forward, we'd know a lot more about how to get these folks back out of the system. We'd know more accurately the prevalence of traumatic brain injury history, and we'd know better what works to get them out of the system. So we did not, and we've been doing a better job of it just in the last uh, four or five years. So let's talk about how often it's true that people have a traumatic brain injury history. I mentioned the 25 to 97%. There's lots of research over the years. This has gained a lot of steam more recently as there is a, a bigger and uh, more deliberate emphasis in the policy world on diversion programming and in risk need responsivity programming. So this is matching the criminal justice response to an individual's need and their risk for reoffense, for example, and importantly, the treatment need. So you can see in county jails, the number is very high, 65% of men, 73% of women. Remember that uh, county jails have kind of a lot of cross traffic going through them. The average length of stay is two weeks. These are folks who are headed into Department of Corrections and they're serving very short term sentences and they're on their way back out into the community. In a lot of ways, uh, our research with county jails suggests that they really are the revolving door of the criminal justice system, right? Folks are like churned through that system on a uh, repeating basis and are on a first day basis with all of the jail staff, which uh, seems um, insane that your social support would be uh, limited to correctional personnel, but for a lot of folks that's true. And um, we're gonna talk more about disrupting this with social support later. 87% of folks who have a history of justice involvement, so this includes probationers, also inmates, report a history of TBI in their lifetime. Almost uh, more than a third of them have a history in the last year. 
and really importantly, that number is about half when we talk about juvenile corrections. The number is lower in community correction settings, so in juvenile probation, for example, and it makes a lot of sense. You can see the escalation of traumatic brain injury history uh, in the escalation of confinement levels in the juvenile justice system. So you see that uh, the kinds of problems kids have with more severe injuries are likely to be uh, reflected in higher levels of confinement in the system. These data aren't unique to the US, although we do have the uh, dubious distinction of incarcerating more people in this country than anywhere else in the world. Uh, we, with really dubious distinction, incarcerate more youth than any other industrialized country in the world. If you look at the data from our peers around the world, this overrepresentation of people of traumatic brain injury history among people in criminal justice holds true everywhere. You see it in Canada, where interestingly, very few people are incarcerated. Canada has a much more robust community correction system than the US has, a really deliberate emphasis on diversion from incarceration. But in that system, they see the same overrepresentation of TBI. It's true also in France, it's true in the UK. Special shout out to our colleagues in uh, New Zealand and Australia who really pioneered this research and their numbers are among the highest. This is a really important little sidebar that I wanna mention. And uh, this is partly uh, a commitment that I have based on the kind of work we've been doing for eight years, but also a public service message from all of our judicial colleagues. The risk for sustaining a brain injury while you're incarcerated is extraordinarily high. This is one of my favorite research studies because it has such an elegant design to it. So this was a study of the New York City correctional system, which famously includes Rikers Island, uh, the census of which is lower now, but still regarded to be one of the most dangerous criminal justice settings in the country. Uh, so the elegant design of this study though, was studying the New York City correctional system and matching its traumatic brain injury data to neighboring emergency rooms. So these are emergency rooms serving the community alongside those correctional settings. So uh, it was an undergraduate college students or community survey. This was matching it to the communities the same institutions serve. So the addition of traumatic brain injury or injury to the head, that was added to the correctional health record in 2012. And they tracked the frequency with which people uh, presented to the infirmary with uh, an injury to the head. So you can imagine that uh, there were more injuries even than were seen and treated in the infirmary. What is true, interestingly, of those data is that the rate at which people were injured in the New York City correctional system was 50 times higher than in the neighboring emergency rooms. This number was 10 times higher than the rate at which people are being injured in uh, international settings. So uh, Operation Desert Storm, Operation Iraqi and Enduring Freedom. So it's uh, jails are an extraordinarily dangerous place. So for youth in particular, who may go into division of youth corrections, they may go into that setting without a brain injury and the risk for sustaining an injury while they're in custody is really high. So why does it matter that we know something about if someone has a brain injury history or not? What risk does having a brain injury history confer? What does it uh, say about their case? How do we forecast outcomes for inmates in this case who have a brain injury history, their long-term prognosis for successful community reintegration is much lower without supports. So you can see that they, uh, folks with brain injury in the criminal justice system use more supports while they're incarcerated. So they use more health services, more mental health services. They spend more time on suicide watch while they're incarcerated. They have a much lower rate of uh, making contact with community service providers, and they have a much lower rate of successfully completing treatment with those community providers, and they have a much higher rate of reoffense. So, uh, particularly in some settings with adults, a higher rate of violent reoffense without services. 
you can see this relationship where uh, someone is injured while they're incarcerated and the risk for violent or aggressive behavior increases after the brain injury. So you actually set them up to have a harder time after they're released. They have a, a more problematic course of their incarceration. They're more likely to have disciplinary infractions and get into fights with other inmates. And in some really rare cases, they pose a security threat to personnel. So they may get combative, they're easily agitated and hard to deescalate. It's also true that for uh, folks with a single brain injury, the risk to sustain a second and then a third brain injury get higher with each injury. But also what you see in this slide from my colleagues in, in Kentucky is that there's a clear dose response relationship between the number of injuries and the likelihood of having some of these kinds of uh, negative or adverse outcomes. So uh, blue here is uh, the rate of depression in folks in criminal justice settings who have no history of brain injury. The red is folks who are identified to have a single significant brain injury and the yellow are the uh, two plus. So these are folks with more than just the one head injury. And you can see this really neat relationship in all of these adverse circumstances. So including uh, mood disorder, all of these behavioral health problems, but importantly also with self-harm. And this will come up again and again and again. And with kids, this is the school to prison pipeline. I cannot overstate the degree to which uh, kids who have this cluster of self-control problems, impulsivity, inattention, difficulty concentrating, you see an incredible risk for academic failure. When you look at the school to prison pipeline, which is this, uh, Everybody here knows the model, but you see uh, the school to prison pipeline is preceded in all of those cases by academic difficulty and academic failure. In our Colorado youth data, so this is with our division of youth corrections and in our um, Denver juvenile probation, we found that 62% of the kids with brain injury history had a history of school suspension. And that number is about 5% in the general community. And importantly, 35% of them had been expelled from school. So there is a really direct fast track, do not pass go track for kids who fail out of school. They lack the academic supports, they lack the social supports to manage their injury. And their only route is into criminal justice. And that's the only place where their needs are supported. And it's really difficult for them to then get back out. Importantly, if you know someone has a brain injury history, you could do something about it. I'll, we'll never ask someone to treat a brain injury. We're asking all of our treatment providers to treat the deficits related to the brain injury. So that might be uh, someone has an anger management problem or inattention or you're capitalizing on uh, modifications to psychotherapy to accommodate a memory deficit, for example. So this is about treating the deficit, not the brain injury. And if you identify someone with a brain injury history, they may actually be eligible for other services. So in the case of Pennsylvania, you have a really robust statewide association, the Brain Injury Association of Pennsylvania, also the AEDY program, this is precisely what they're great at doing is intervening in that school to prison pipeline. And you could do something in the classroom, you can do something in psychotherapies, uh, you can give parents and caregivers a set of tools to help them manage the kids frustration and their own frustration too. So there's a way that you can address these problems. A special shout out to the Brain Steps program there in Colorado, or not in Colorado, in Pennsylvania, Colorado has adopted our own brain steps model using the pioneering work of uh, Brenda Egan Johnson there. The brain steps program in Pennsylvania is really the national leader in educational support and intervention for kids with brain injury. And uh, if that's not already like bookmarked on your web browser or uh, you know, flagged in your phone as a favorite, it really should be. They might be um, among the best at what they do. And certainly we've adopted their whole model here in Colorado and feel really proud of the work that we're doing here with credit entirely to the work that uh, Brain Steps is doing there in Pennsylvania. 
So let me just share some of the data from our Colorado project, and then I'm gonna do a little bit deeper dive into our juvenile data and the Pennsylvania collaboration. So some of the work that we've done uh, with your teams there, looking at juvenile justice data in particular. Here are some of our partners from our program here in Colorado. Again, we're in year eight. We have about 20 partner sites statewide here in Colorado. The Colorado brain injury TBI model has three aims. The first is screening for brain injury and cognitive impairment. So this will be, I cannot overstate the importance of the, uh, it's not enough to just know that someone has a brain injury. You also have to know something about what their cognition looks like so that you can modify treatment as usual or education as usual to accommodate those deficits. So not just screening for brain injury, but screening for brain injury and impairment. We're also in endeavoring to make a warm handoff between especially for kids to identify the brain injury eligibility and making a handoff to our special education team, our brain steps team here in Colorado. And then our third aim is to do education and capacity building. This is partly education for the stakeholders themselves. So this is brain injury survivors, kids and their families, but also for judges and uh, probation officers and juvenile correctional officers. It's, uh, it's a way that we've found we get a huge return on our time is to invest in providing frustration management strategies to correctional officers and to judges who also hate to see kids come through their courts over and over again. So our first aim, so brain injury screening and identification. So we use the OSU TBI ID, which is the Ohio State University Traumatic Brain Injury Identification Method. And the OSU TBI ID flags significant traumatic brain injury history. So uh, one thing it does not flag is an acquired brain injury. So there are a, a whole host of kids that this screen will miss, including kids with near lethal overdoses. Uh, we see more and more of that, sadly, in Colorado with opiate overdoses. So uh, those kids may have really pervasive deficits related to an anoxic brain injury, but we're not picking them up on this screen. So this screen is looking just for traumatic brain injury. Statistically speaking, traumatic brain injury is the most common cause of brain injury, especially among kids. So we have John Corrigan on our research team, He's been really gracious to allow us to do research with his instrument and to modify the scoring. So you have the OSU on the next few slides here. So I'll show you uh, first page, second page, but the OSU has typically five scoring criteria. We've modified that to be three scoring criteria. Our suggestion is to use the three scoring criteria and we've published with the three scoring criteria. So there's uh, great validity to it. The other two criteria we thought drove the uh, potential false positive rate up too high. Here, the OSU is flagging three kinds of injuries as significant. The first kind of injury that's significant is any injury with a loss of consciousness of more than 30 minutes. So this is any moderate or severe injury. The second is any injury with a loss of consciousness before age 15. This is relatively arbitrary, but 15 shows up as uh, a cutoff in the research in terms of pediatric brain injury and the risk for poorer long-term outcomes. So we're flagging as significant injuries with a loss of consciousness uh, in childhood. So here we've defined that as before age 15 and this multiple category. So we're looking to flag uh, women who are exposed to interpersonal violence, for example, kids who are exposed to gang violence, who've been beaten in and out of several gangs. So these are uh, folks with three or more injuries with altered mental status or two injuries with a loss of consciousness in a three month period of time. Importantly, you use a structured tool like the OSU because oftentimes we don't have the luxury of medical records. If you use a single question item. A lot of uh, educational settings will embed a single question on a screening questionnaire in a health history survey about have you had a traumatic brain injury? And interestingly, 
uh, almost half of folks will answer no to that question, even if they have a significant brain injury. So the, the term brain injury or head injury may not be part of the story someone tells about themselves or for kids, part of the story they've been told as they've grown up, but using a tool like the OSU to elicit all the times they've been injured and hospitalized and then winnowing down on injuries to the head and neck and then the sequelae or consequences of those injuries. This is second to gold standard in the identification of reported traumatic brain injury history. Uh, wearing my neuropsych hat, my favorite part is the cognitive screening. So uh, we have a model here in Colorado where we built a two hour, now that we're doing it virtually, it's a one hour cognitive screening battery or neuropsychological screening battery. And we're using, if we're doing an in-person battery, we're using either a computerized battery, the a is my favorite, or a paper and pencil screening battery. These are instruments that are available for use at the master's level. Uh, right now, while we're doing these evaluations in juvenile justice settings and adult criminal justice settings, virtually we're using the MOCA blind. and um, the MOCA blind can be used by anyone with any level of education. And right now I think the requirement is to do the one hour MOCA training before February 1st, I think to continue to use the instrument, uh, but it is a great tool. So the MOCA blind can be administered by tele services. So uh, otherwise you might consider using the MOCA itself if you're working in person and you're working at the uh, bachelor's professional level. That second aim for support is to make that warm handoff between the person, the kid or adult with a traumatic brain injury. And in the case of Colorado with our brain injury, we have uh, Brain Injury Alliance of Colorado is our uh, statewide service. One of the things that they provide is resource facilitation or care coordination uh, for our um, pediatric population, so kids with brain injury, we're really fortunate to have uh, brain steps, which I mentioned earlier, and BIAC has been really scrappy about making its services available in the educational system. So one of the models that we have, for example, is that uh, BIAC is embedded in all of the emergency providers around the state, and if kids are seen for brain injury, a referral is made automatically to the Brain Injury Alliance of Colorado, also to the local brain steps team. So we try to create a tighter safety net to catch the kids at the time that they're injured. Again, nine of 10 kids won't be seen in an emergency room at the time of their injury. So we're really only catching one of 10 kids, but we're committed to doing that. Here's our uh, BIAC model. Uh, I think, uh, Pennsylvania has some different funding sources. Our funding sources are limited to surcharges on uh, speeding tickets, surcharges on DUI, DWAI. Uh, we saw a tremendous boon from surcharges on driving while impaired thanks to uh, marijuana laws. So uh, the, um, uh, the nut of funding is about $4 million a year. So you can imagine that we put a lot of um, uh, folks to, to those dollars to good use here in Colorado. We have education. So this is like brain injury awareness programming around the country, around the um, Colorado. We do a lot of countrywide education too. Services is our resource facilitation care coordination. And then we're one of the few uh, statewide brain injury programs to fund uh, empirical research. So we're really committed to driving the field forward with uh, research, and some of this is bench research and some is applied social science research. Our third aim is education, and this is the um, judicial education, the stakeholder education. I'm going to circle back and make the point again and again about how important self-advocacy training is, especially for uh, younger adults and kids. Uh, I'm going to share one case example, but we think of in Colorado, our secret sauce has been our self-advocacy training and how powerful that has been and how remarkable the messaging has been, especially for kids as they're stuck in the system and they learn to see themselves differently and they feel empowered to take charge of their deficits and to ask for the accommodations they need. So let me just share some of our Colorado data 
And these, this is a totally busy table, but I'm going to make a point really briefly about our adult data. And then I'll circle out and um, pull some of our juvenile data to the front so that we can look at Colorado data and then also Pennsylvania data. So here you can see of all of our uh, brain injury screens, we've done just about 4,600 of those. Oh my God, sorry. This is like the pre spell checked version. Uh, our overall positivity rate for the OSU. So this is the rate at which the OSU showed first worst or multiple brain injury history was about 44% overall. A few important pieces of data to pull out here. Uh, you can see our juvenile probation number was about 18%. Really interestingly, our division of youth corrections data are separate and I'll share those in just a minute. I also want to point out some of our specialty courts. So this is a, um, a female offender program, an FOP program. So that number was 97%. And we found that the rate of traumatic brain injury for female inmates and probationers is extraordinarily high. Uh, importantly, their risk of having been exposed to multiple violence-related TBIs was six times higher than it was true for um, their male peers in the criminal justice system. Our neuropsychological battery, so this two-hour battery that we did, those data yielded really interesting findings about the rate of psychosocial vulnerabilities. So you can see that we did a total of almost a thousand of those neuropsychological screens. From a population perspective, we were committed to getting as many women into our research as possible. So we had about a third of our research population, programming population is uh, female. And we have the traditional overrepresentation, problematic overrepresentation of racial and ethnic minorities in our correctional system. So we see those also in our program. And we have a slightly higher percentage of folks who identify themselves as veterans relative to the Colorado community. When you look at their mechanism of injury, there are some really interesting data to emerge. So here on the right, these are CDC statistics. What's true for the larger population is that the most common mechanism of traumatic brain injury is a fall. And you see uh, car accidents and um, hitting something are uh, kind of second and third close by assault. So this is interpersonal violence ranges in the data anywhere from nine to 11% of the mechanism of injury for the general population. What you see in a criminal justice population this includes juvenile probationers. There's an average of three or more injuries in their history, but what you see is the most common cause of injury is interpersonal assault. So it's 3x the rate at which people are injured by assault in the general population. So that's a really unique finding there. Uh, you can see here that motor vehicle and fall are kind of two and three just as they are for the general population. And then uh, we saw a little uptick in blast exposure largely attributed to our veteran um, service personnel who are in the criminal justice system. For uh, each one of those categories that I mentioned for the OSU, so the rate at which folks had an injury before age 15 was almost 57%. Uh, these aren't mutually exclusive. That's why the number doesn't add to 100%. The rate at which people had uh, one injury that is moderate or severe, so this is an injury with a loss of consciousness of more than 30 minutes, was 55%. Remember that some of these injuries would have occurred before age 15, so that's why they'd be counted in both categories. And 62% of folks had been exposed to more than three injuries with altered mental status or more than two injuries in a three month period of time with a loss of consciousness. 70% almost of folks had a significant cognitive impairment. We used a threshold of two standard deviations below the mean as a definition for uh, using the word deficit to describe someone's cognitive behavior. And the really stunning data are that the risk for having all of these other behavioral health complications was extraordinarily high. So here you can see the risk of a substance use problem. And you guys could like barely see this. Uh, apologies, it will show up better on the slides as you're looking at them. The likelihood 
of having a substance abuse problem, if you're in criminal justice with a traumatic brain injury, 95 plus percent of folks had a significant substance use problem. 76% of folks had a significant history of mental illness, major mental illness. Really importantly, the rate of suicidal ideation was about 100%. So we looked instead at the rate at which people had at least one suicide attempt, and that number was 39%. So almost 40% of the criminal justice population with a traumatic brain injury had a history of attempted suicide. The rate at which people were exposed to childhood violence and were the victim of violence as an adult was about 60%, so 60% and then 59.9% for adult trauma. Uh, I mentioned before school suspension, so 62% of folks had a history of school suspension and the little gray bar here, uh, those are population norms. I coined the term the superfecta because trifecta was taken in horse racing and uh, we used the term to describe people who had really four psychosocial vulnerabilities. So one is a criminal history. So these are folks with who've been involved in the criminal justice system. 74% of folks had uh, substance abuse and mental illness who also have a TBI. And 74% of folks have a, a substance use problem, mental illness, criminal history, and brain injury. So this is from a clinical perspective for folks who are doing any kind of uh, behavioral health intervention. This is the picture that you see in clinical practice. This is the really intractable problem that it's difficult to get a handle on. It's what contributes also to risk for uh, reoffense, risk for relapse in a treatment setting, risk for non-compliance with mental health therapies. So uh, this is a really big deal, this 74%. Looking at our juvenile data in our uh, division of youth corrections, our, uh, the rate of traumatic brain injury was much higher. So in juvenile probation, that number was 18% as the uh, rate of confinement or the level of confinement increased, you saw that the risk of traumatic brain injury was also higher. So that number was 53% statewide in our Division of Youth Corrections, now Division of Youth Services. About a third of folks with traumatic brain injury, juvenile offenders with traumatic brain injury had significant cognitive impairments. And a third of those folks were referred for additional neuropsychological screening to make really uh, specific recommendations for educational uh, and behavioral modification programming. Now, let me just showcase some of the Colorado Pennsylvania collaboration data, because these are really interesting and Pennsylvania is leading the charge on researching uh, youth and brain injury history in criminal justice. Uh, I understand that part of this is uh, a, a, a reflection of the rate at which people, young people are incarcerated in Pennsylvania. Jess and I just had this conversation yesterday. So uh, there are, uh, there's a larger research population to take advantage of, which is also a sad commentary on criminal justice policy at large. So what you see here, and uh, these are by site, so you can see some of the Pennsylvania site. So Pennsylvania also included some of its probation data and then some of its uh, higher confinement level youth corrections data. And then we have our juvenile probation data here. So you can see the same thing is true in Pennsylvania where the, the rate of traumatic brain injury is higher in settings with uh, higher levels of confinement. So 22% relative to 47%. Uh, here, our number was 33% when we uh, pulled out just uh, our research data for the years of this collaboration. Looking at the average number of brain injuries, I mentioned that for our entire sample, which is youth and adult, the average number of brain injuries was three. If you look just at our juvenile data in Colorado, the average number of brain injuries is four. And that number is also true uh, for adults in Pennsylvania with a slightly lower average number of brain injuries for Pennsylvania youth. So that number three for Pennsylvania youth, that number four for Colorado youth. Here you see a representation across the developmental lifespan for kids and the 
time at which they sustain injury. So here you can see a huge uptick in rate of injuries in the 10 to 14 window. And uh, wearing my forensic psychology hat for just a second, this is also the same uptick in criminal behavior that you see in that traditional adolescent limited Moffat model of uh, juvenile criminality. You also see this uh, maps on really cleanly into uh, circulating levels of hormones, sex hormones, for example, right? This uptick for puberty between 10 and 14. So it's not surprising that risk for injury would be higher in that period of time. And kids look more like CDC data in terms of the way that they're injured. So uh, they're more likely to be injured in falls and motor vehicle accidents, but you do start to see an uptick. Remember that this number is 9% in the general population. So you start to see an uptick in the rate at which kids are injured by interpersonal violence. Uh, that number is 36% in the Colorado adult data. And interestingly, just looking at the rate at which people are seen for care, uh, Pennsylvania does a better job of educating kids, families, caregivers to get into emergency rooms. So uh, kids are more likely in Pennsylvania to have been seen for their brain injury uh, in a healthcare setting at the time of the injury. So putting all these pieces together, I just want to uh, remind you the model and then I'm going to share the tools so that you have those too. The model that we're using, the Colorado TBI model, that has a demonstrable effect on risk for reoffense in juvenile offenders and adult offenders has three components. The first component is identifying brain injury history. The second component is taking a snapshot of cognitive function. That can be a cognitive screening battery administered by someone who's practicing at the master's level. It can also be a self-report inventory, which I'm gonna share with you in just a minute. And the third component of our model is self-advocacy, which is, I think, our secret sauce. So what if, and I've got a hyperlink here to neuropsychological screening battery training for professionals at the master's level. We've crafted a battery that um, anyone who thinks like, oh, neuropsychological screening is limited to doctoral level providers, which can be more scarce in a lot of settings. Uh, we've designed a package of uh, screening tools that can be administered by folks practicing at the master's level. So that fits in the scope of practice for master's practice uh, in several states, including Pennsylvania. So uh, that's a screening package that I'm happy to share with everybody. But we also built a self-report inventory because we recognized really quickly that we didn't have the capacity to serve all of the folks in the criminal justice system who needed to be screened. So we developed a set of materials that can be used electronically. You have here, this is the hyperlink. Uh, you have a self-report symptom questionnaire that it, that is designed to look like the domains that are measured on a traditional neuropsychological evaluation, but this is self-report. And importantly, it may not measure the exact same thing that a neuropsychological screening battery does, but it does measure where someone's complaints are and what they think they can't do well. So there's really valuable data here. We have versions in uh, English and in Spanish. Again, totally free, available to you. You should crib those and use them. We also have adult versions. Importantly, once you get a sense of what someone's cognitive complaints are, the really important thing, and this is what I keep uh, circling back to, is you have to do something about it. It's not enough to just flag someone as having a problem and then not respond in some way. So this is uh, the self-report inventory. The neuropsychological screening battery is a way to gauge cognitive functioning, and then you do something about it. So there are lots of great resources about how to accommodate deficits. Um, there are two here. These are both from Brain Injury uh, Association of the US. So this is a great one just uh, for uh, any professional in any setting. This is what each one of these deficits will look like in the room, and this is what to do about it. 
you see here some classroom specific accommodations. So uh, how to manage a kid with poor organization skills, how to manage a kid uh, who has inattention or poor concentration. So uh, some really easy basic things that teachers feel empowered to manage kids better in the classroom and empower those kids to manage themselves and ask for their needs to be met. The other resource that we built uh, for everyone here in Colorado is a set of materials that correspond to that self-report symptom inventory. So in each one of those domains, we have a corresponding uh, strategy booklet. And for youth, here's the hyperlink to all of these materials. We have four uh, sets of uh, accommodation booklets. The first is for criminal justice professionals working with justice involved youth. The second is for behavioral health professionals. So these are folks who are working in any manner of uh, treatment or education setting. The third is for parents and caregivers. So this is a way that you can empower uh, the parents, caregivers, extended family to uh, support kids better and to meet their needs and importantly manage their own frustrations. And the fourth is a booklet for the kid themselves. So uh, with an emphasis on self-advocacy and asking for the needs that you have to be met in uh, whichever setting. So educational settings, uh, kids who are getting a job for the first time, kids who are uh, navigating interpersonal relationships and uh, de-escalating conflict and all of the things that kids are learning how to do. So here are the youth programs. We have the same materials for adults. These, we don't have a family caregiver module. So we just have criminal justice, mental health and client materials. But here's an example of what that looks like in the youth program. So if you use the self-report symptom inventory, what you will see is that a kid will complain of being extremely bothered by uh, speaking without thinking or interrupting people. So you might use the corresponding accommodation booklet for impulsivity. You could use the version uh, written for you if you're working as uh, doing substance use or uh, you're working in um, a juvenile probation setting. And you would hand the kid or give it to them electronically uh, their corresponding tip sheet. So here for impulsivity, here for emotional dysregulation, it's written for them. We have uh, a program that scores these online and emails you the tip sheets and you could just download and print all the paper copies. So whichever is easier. And the self-advocacy piece. So uh, this is a colleague who, um, this right here, Markel Taylor, uh, he participated in our jail screening at Denver County Jail and uh, first entered the juvenile criminal justice system when he was 15, was coming through Denver County Jail for I think the 22nd time was his criminal history. Uh, and the experience of having a conversation about his deficits and his strengths and really importantly how to use his strengths to accommodate his deficits and the things that he really needed to ask for uh, was so profound that he's gotten himself out of the system. He built, uh, it's called Rebuild Your Mind, which is this stakeholder driven program. It looks a lot like the ice bucket challenge for ALS, but this is his effort to build a platform that destigmatizes criminal history, destigmatizes brain injury history and mental health or mental illness. Um, he is uh, like truly extraordinary. You can visit Rebuild Your Mind on Facebook. You could see all the folks who posted the challenge. What's so remarkable though, is that this is driven entire, entirely by Markel, his peers who are out of jail, and he has a whole cohort of folks who are building and contributing to this program from jail. So uh, really remarkable stuff. We have a, a whole set of educational modules available online. This is our AHEAD program. Uh, AHEAD, which is like a clever acronym for a way too wordy title, Achieving Healing and Education, Accountability and Determination. So our AHEAD program. Uh, our URL for the juvenile training is coming soon, but I can make all of these materials available to you. 
Uh, and I say coming soon, like uh, it was due to us in January. So uh, it should be literally any day now from our web developers. And I was hoping to have it today, but as of last night, we were like still days away. So uh, I'll share that with Jess and make sure that she gets it out to everybody. But here's the adult version. There's the URL hyperlinked there. We built this as a, um, a, a six module program that was uh, designed to be delivered in person as a kind of group therapy. And it was magnificent. Folks uh, connected with each other. They felt empowered and supported by the peer dynamic in the room. And when the suggestion was floated to make the curriculum available as a self-paced online uh, curriculum, I kind of balked at it and I thought, well, that will lose the magic of the stuff that happens in the room and instead, this has proven to be much more popular. So uh, I'm really proud to be able to share it with you. You will love the resource and you could adapt it in whatever ways make sense for your settings. Finally, I just am sharing these last resources that I want everyone to bookmark and have at the ready. One of them is Co-Kids with Brain Injury, which is our um, statewide network of materials for teachers, for juvenile justice providers. This is a terrific resource, even for adults. I drive uh, adult providers to this site. It has everything you need to respond appropriately to kids in the classroom. Here's again, our AHEAD link. Here's a link to the OSU. If you wanna use that tool, it's free. Everything I've shared with you today is totally free. And then our partners at the Denver VA in the Rocky Mountain MIREC, uh, as part of our grant funded project, they built a set of educational resources with traumatic brain injury. In particular, they have a module for justice involved persons. So if you're working in a behavioral health setting, these are really terrific resources. And with that, I have uh, left us just four minutes for Q&A and Apologies again for covering so much material. It's like, I can't not get everything out there and share everything there is to share. We're all working so hard to put this together and uh, we're so committed to making a difference. And the only way we do that is if we band together, share the wealth and spread the love. So thanks for having me, Jess. Kim, thank you so much. That was such an incredible amount of information in an hour. And I know our field is already asking us, where can I get this? So um, everybody participating, please know that this was recorded. It will be sent for closed captioning. We will put it back in the Schoology. We, run, we have a whole course, Kim, just for your knowledge, in Schoology awesome. that taught as everything AEDY and supports and resources for our field. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to put it in the chat box. Um, we did put, uh, Kat just put in how to join Schoology in the bit.ly. So you can go ahead and join Schoology and see our repository of information if you haven't already joined. And we will be putting in Act 48. Um, there's a link to the Google Doc. We'd like that completed by Friday so you can get your hour Act 48. Um, yeah, so Kim's resources will all be posted and they are fantastic. They will be of great use to you. Um, and we just so appreciate your participation and, and your engagement today in today's presentation. I'll continue to look. People are saying thank you, Kim, um, for any questions. And Jess, I mentioned this at the beginning, but uh, we're all in this together. So if I can be helpful, you guys, I'm so findable at the University of Denver. Uh, you also have my email, yes. my telephone number, uh, my Twitter handle. You've got everything you need to be able to find me. And if I can ever weigh in or be helpful or support your work in any way, count on it. We so appreciate that. Again, thank you so much for presenting to the field today. There is no code. There is just the link to Act 48 and you will go ahead and fill out that uh, Google Doc and we will go ahead and move forward and giving you credit. Thanks again, everyone.